Hello, and welcome to the 100th curmudgeon in the cellar on YouTube. And tonight, I'm going to do a little ranting. And just to get it off, you know, get it off my chest. And um, if I get too worked up, might be not quite suitable for work. I don't know. We'll see how it goes. Depends on how, how much I get my dander up. That's my dander damper. We'll see how it goes. Oh, drop my script. Great start. Yeah, you never know. I'd done this a hundred times, would you? <laughs> okay, first off, what has our society come to in the in the respect to what we watch for entertainment? There are two individuals, I'd call them idiots, but they'd sue me if I did, so I won't. They're doing a program for the History Channel called Kings of Pain. And these two questionable individuals go around the world, allowing themselves to be bitten and stung and impaled on spines, etc., of the most horrible stuff you can imagine. In pursuit of measuring a scale of pain. <laughs> While I don't, can't argue that maybe that might not be a valid pursuit. I can't understand why it became a spectator sport. I mean, watching guys, these two, it, these two individuals, <laughs> almost said that suable word again. Uh, allow themselves to be stung by scorpions and bitten by snakes and lizards. My God, is there nothing better to watch? How weird do you have to go before you watch? Now, curiosity says, okay, I'm going to watch the first one or something. Uh, I didn't even bother with that. I, they're watching them biting on the, on the, 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 the trailers. No, uh, no. Can't we find something better to watch than that? The lowest common denominator now is watching people suffer excruciating pain on camera. <clears throat> now, let's get to ranting. Going to lube up for this. I was scrolling down my Facebook feed, and I came across a post from the old school D&D page. One of the purple backgrounds. And all it said was, 5e sucks ass. Not only did the individual um, <laughs> give us all a clear indication of their logic skills. My question is, why? Why do you, if you're an old school gamer, why do you give a damn if somebody else is playing 5e? They're gamers. They're gamers. We're all a brotherhood. Okay? You like one game, a certain game. I like another game. This person likes another game. Why do you feel the need to belittle? It's that kind of bullshit behavior that is, I'm beginning to think, rightfully causing the new wave of gamers, the 5e players, to think that we're a bunch of old, constipated, grouchy old men. Why? Arguing about, oh, you play that, you're stupid, oh, that edition sucks, whatever. No. What's the point? That makes as much sense as me going on my page and going, stud poker sucks. Why? I happen to prefer Hold'em. Now, why do I want to get into an argument with poker players on which the best game? Who cares? I play mine. You play yours. 
What difference does it make? This stupid, moronic, kindergarten-level name-calling on edition one, it's all bullshit. It's all it is. It's bullshit. It doesn't do the hobby any good for somebody looking at the outside going, oh, these guys can't even agree with themselves what they ought to play. What difference? There are several RPG systems that I don't care for. Why should I go on and say such and such sucks? This is stupid. And what? You know, why? What do I accomplish? What do you accomplish? Troll bait? Click bait? You know, that's, that's, like, that's like throwing a turd in the middle of the room and then running out just to see what will happen. I'm just about as smart. The addition wars are not doing us any good. It's the same thing as this okay boomer shit. I'm tired of that too. All right? Why? What's the point? One group deriding another group. Hey, we're all citizens. Hey, we're all gamers. There ought to be some loyalty to each other. I don't care what game you play. I don't care if you've got $35,000 set in, in, in Warhammer 4000 or 40K or whatever that, all right, which I think it, that would, to me would be a colossal waste of money and time. But I don't care. If that's what floats your boat, I got a friend that likes painting up Warhammer stuff. Okay. I'm not going to deride him for it. What is the point of this crap? Come on. Aren't we grown-ups? Aren't we supposed to be grown-ups? Aren't we, on the on, on, as a general thing, supposed to be rather intelligent grown-ups? It serves no purpose. It wastes energy, creates derision and division. Stupid. And one last rant. What in the hell has happened to common sense in the DMs? I see so many questions on Facebook. People throw it out because they don't know what to do. They're being bullied by their players or whatever. And more often than not, common sense presents an answer right there on its face. Prima facie. This particular debate <laughs> was about a dwarf using a longbow. On its face, does that make physical sense that a three and a half or a four foot uh, individual with arms proportionally that long can use a five or six or even long even six foot or even perhaps a bit more long bow that is made to be drawn from the middle you gotta reach up like this to reach the middle and shoot it over your head or shoot it even with your eyes while it's propped on the ground Common sense. If the dwarf wants to have a bow, fine. Let him find a really nice short bow that has some pluses. Every time I put a plus on an item I put in, it doesn't mean it's magical. It just means it's better than average. And that's immediately explained upon finding it and testing it out and everything. No, it doesn't feel like it's got any magic vibe, but man, does this thing do the job. This is incredible craftsmanship. So give him a short bow. This shoots better than an average short bow. Give him a crossbow. Give him a magic dwarven recurve bow. If you got a dwarf that wants to be an archer, let him be an archer. But, you know, um, I guess if you wanted to take the thing, that, oh, everybody ought to be able to do whatever they want and completely ignore common sense, I guess you could have a dwarven craftsman make a copy of the uneven curved bow that the samurai use, because it has a much lower, uh, much shorter lower half or lower part underneath the handle. I don't know the names. But where would he see one? <laughs> Common sense, folks. Common sense. Sure, th some things. Does it make common sense that somebody wants to run and jump across a 14 foot uh, gap into a chasm? 
you and I might not think that's common sense, but hey, it's fantasy and you can roll and try. And if your stats already say that you're, you're adept and you're strong and everything, well, sure, you ought to be able to do that. But you or I want to go make a running jump over a 14 foot uh, gap. Uh, not me uh, going on almost 71. <laughs> no, but it's fantasy. But use some common sense. When did common sense fall out of the DM's toolkit? That's, that's my most used tool. I apply common sense. Then if it lends itself to fantasy, I have a point from which to go. A dwarf wanting to use a six-foot English single unit, whatever, one, one type of wood you bow on its face is silly. Why do you argue with the players? And if they want to go on about it, ask them to draw you out the mechanics of how that dwarf is going to fire that bow and hit anything. Is he going to carry a step stool or a step ladder so he can deploy his ladder and jump up and shoot? Common sense, DMs. Common sense. Yeah, it's fantasy, but you've got to have a basis from which to start. Then you can selectively decide when to violate common sense in the pursuit of good fantasy, good role playing, and good storytelling. Common sense. <laughs> I posted something on Facebook last week that. Um, it was a it was a um, a response. I guess it was a tweet or something from a from an EMT who made fifteen dollars an hour uh, upon finding out that um, burger flippers were now making fifteen dollars an hour. Now, okay, burger flippers. I don't know that it's pejorative, but it's generally referred to entry level jobs at fast food joints. <laughs> well, I got an email response taking offense with that term because he'd been a line cook and he was defending line cooks and all that. Hey, I was a line cook too. I ran a whole shift when I was still in high school at the airport Howard Johnson's Motel and Inn, you know, restaurant and a hotel. And I, I was 17 years old running a shift. I appreciate a good line cook, but I didn't have anybody that worked for me flipping burgers that wasn't qualified to flip burgers. Um, I don't think that calling somebody a burger flipper, I didn't see it as an insult, but this individual did and says we need a new term for a derisive reference to a low entry level job in the fast food industry. I leave that to you, the public, to come up with something. Silly. All right. We're gonna go with it go to some questions. I was a fan from your blog of your blog back in the Dragonfoot days and stumbled on your channel here. Do you take questions from the show from comments here or do you take them from Facebook, Twitter or something? Well actually I prefer to get comments here. As a comment, I don't care if it's on this individual show or another question out of the blue or something I said way back when. As long as you reference <laughs> when it was way back when that I said it, that's fine. That's how I get material for each in each show is trying to elucidate, expand, or explain myself on something I said previously. So, yes, I'd love to have them. Now, I do find topics on Facebook just when I feel I see something silly going on or something I feel like... I'm going <clears> to <throat> comment on something going on. So, yeah, I do that a little. Next, was Greyhawk, Blackmore, or Men in Magic post-apocalyptic disguised as medieval fantasy? Was it supposed to have everything like heavy metal comics, or was it 
rules as written on an always medieval historic fantasy. Well, I can only speak to Gary's dungeon, what I know of Dave's dungeon, and um, what I know of the book Men and Magic, the first book, based on all the other books following it that I edited and helped write. No, it was always medieval fantasy. Gary had a fascination with the period in time. Uh, the writers of the, you know, like Harold Lamb, just give you a quick one off the top of my head, um, that uh, wrote medieval fantasy, Ivanhoe, um, all, all that, you know, Sir Walter Scott, all that good stuff. That was That was Gary's bag when he was younger. And so he always set out to create a fantasy role playing based on that period as i said in an earlier thing to to make good fantasy you have to have a grounding in reality you have to have some handholds before you start climbing down that tunnel and that's what he used and he was into the song of roland and you know the heroic paladins and all that kind of stuff and um that's where it came from as far as I know, Dave Arneson had very similar tastes in his reading. I can't speak to Dave's detail because I was never a part of his gaming group. But you could talk to people from his gaming group and maybe some of the ones that are still around that knew him way back and when can tell you what he liked to read. I have a suspicion that he and Gary shared a great deal of their reading in their reading preferences because that's how they connected. I suspect that because that's how Gary and I connected when we discovered that uh, through the course of our budding friendship that we both had the majority of what became appendix in in common. Having said that, um, I, I do not know anything um, that might have made it post-apocalyptic. I do know <clears throat> that Gary, on a couple of occasions, experimented with sci-fi stuff, but that was just like a one-off or you know something strange. It was never meant to be anything but what it was: medieval fantasy, fighting monsters and, and e evil wizards and stuff like that. He f absolutely abhorred the idea of guns or that kind of explosives in in his games, and we rigidly kept that stuff out. Um, so to my knowledge, no, that was never, ever, uh, anything disguised. It was just what it was. It was a fantasy swords and sorcery. Stop and think about the majority of those books in appendix N and how they're set. While they are certainly fantasy, <clears throat> they have a great deal of grounding and enough familiarity that you don't feel like you're, you know, treading water. As far as I can say, no, it was never meant to be anything but what it was. Now, <clears throat> I have just recently uh, started reskinning one of my adventures that I wrote as pure sword and sorcery fantasy. I'm going to reskin it. Both, I'm going to, you know, leave it this way, but I'm going to do maybe a parallel columns or parallel facing pages, whatever. I'm going to reskin it uh, for post-apocalyptic um, because I saw the possibility that if um, that, that, that the center of the adventure could, could become an enormous weapon uh, in a post-apocalyptic setting. So um, I, with the help of Jim Wampler, I'm going to reskin it uh, so you, and when when it comes out, it'll be both sets of rules. Hi, here's a way to play it in fantasy. Here's a way to play it in post-apocalyptic sci-fi. Um, so you can, it, can, it can be done, but you have to reskin it. You can't just cover it over. Um, you can design disguise something as a magic bang stick that bangs once, <laughs> it makes a hole in the wall, and then doesn't work anymore. Uh, that would be like Metamorphosis Alpha, that not D and D. Um, and, and rules as written shouldn't apply to either Gary or, or Dave, 
or any of us in those first couple three years because the rules were nowhere near uh, anything uh, graspable and and capable of being firmed up at that time. We were still multiple uh, multiply modifying and and adding in new stuff and uh, yeah. Um, ah, somebody who was a game hole and said that while he was there, he favored the taco truck. Well, <laughs> anybody who knows Alex Cameron, the man that puts all this great stuff on together, uh, anybody that knows Alex know that it was going to be a taco truck there and they would probably be outstanding. I just never made it to the taco truck because I didn't get past the meatball slider truck. But I'm sure if there was a taco truck there, it was probably outstanding or Alex would not have allowed it. That man's as dedicated to tacos as any uh, Caucasian male I have ever met. Uh, pardon me, got to keep the tonsils lubricated. Um, now, a comment on Traveler. His favorite non-TSR game back in late 70s, early 80s. Um, yeah, I've heard that from lots and lots of people. I never got into travel because of the um, long, boring stretches of doing nothing. Uh, so, um, in, in my opinion. Now, of course, that was my initial opinion of the early game, the early rules, et cetera, et cetera. It just didn't appeal to me. Um, I certainly recognize the fact that it was appealed to a whole lot of people, and it's a very well done system of rules. Um, this guy always used his dad's alignment chart and the ready ref sheets. Oh, I got a funny story about the ready reference sheets. As you might know, the collectors all they all get you know they they know every issue or every every printing. Um, second printing, you know, what staples were used, all this kind of stuff. Well, the reference sheets came in two forms. The first ones were very unique. And the second ones were more practical. And one time when we were in the gray building, um, so that gives you a time period of like uh, 76 to 70, late 77, early 78, eight when this retail uh, part moved down to the hotel. We were collating, and so we went down the basement, and we had pallets of, you know, book one, book two, book three, ready reference sheets, and um, went down and got a box of book ones and a box of book twos and a box of book threes, and we found a box, big, deep box, about this deep, of the first ready reference sheets, the pretty ones. So we just grabbed it. And, you know, it was way out of, the point being, it was way out of sequence. Uh, we, it was going in with third and fourth and fifth printing books, and it hadn't been printed since, like, the second printing. And that's when some of the serious collectors found out that we produced Frankensteins. We sent out boxes uh, with three books in it that weren't all necessarily from the same printing. But I will explain that and the ways and wherefores of that before, so we don't need to go into that here. But uh, just a funny story about ready reference sheets. Let's see what else we got here. Um, thanks for doing the shows. Yeah, I like listening to me talk, too. <laughs> That's why I do them. I did something on EtherCon uh, tonight, earlier, um, about uh, writing and what I look for when I'm trying to sell writing and what I look for when I'm the one buying the writing and stuff. Um, oh, I'm sad that we never got to hear the actual two spells that Benny would use to snuff out his mark. Well, it was something about going back in time and then um, obliterating uh, uh, the parents at the at the moment of conception or something like that. <laughs> anyway, he never existed. Um, okay, after listening to your glowing report on Game Hall, I was curious about what elements set the truly gaming, truly great gaming conventions apart from the good conventions. What are my three worst experiences at a convention? Well, um, what makes it good for me, all right? And I have um, I have my very own set of criteria. I'm one of the, if not the senior oldest <laughs> guy left in the hobby. 
that's still like, capable of getting out and getting around, you know, and doing things and have all my marbles. And I can, you know, I, I ride scooters at the cons just because long walks make my feet burn. Uh, my joints and hips and everything work just great. It's just the uh, damage in my palms and my bottoms of my feet for the chemo. Um, and the treatment I get, obviously, colors my view. Um, the cons I go to, to one degree or another, I get comped. Uh, they might give me a room and I get myself there. Um, they might fly me out there and put me up and, um, feed me, you know, I, I it's, it's a nice, nice, nice time to be me. Uh, uh, the, I love going out to total con in Massachusetts. Um, I'm committed to Gary con as long as I'm able to go. Organization is a big thing that makes a con good. Um, I love going to Texas. I've been, I've gone to every one that Doug has thrown in Texas now. Um, he flies me down, and I have the added bonus of getting to uh, see my son and his family because they also live down in near Dallas. Uh, and I love going to Game Hole because Alex treats me like a king. And I can't, he can't, you know. Um, so. Those things make it personally, but what I also wouldn't do because I've gone to other con cons and been comped and don't go anymore because they were poorly organized. Um, they, they the, the vibe was bad. Um, they, um, they were doomed. Uh, I went to a con west of where I live. And um, I could tell from the business model that they were going into the toilet, and they did shortly, <laughs> shortly thereafter. Um, they were poorly organized. They didn't know how to run a con. Too many, too many people got in for free, saying they'd run a game, and then nobody showed up to run the games, and they all got in free anyway. So the guys that were putting it on went broke. Um, I don't, uh, there's, an, there's another con that I just didn't like the management. I didn't like their approach. Uh, I didn't like one of their individuals, so I didn't go back anymore. Also, it sort of, it, it made my schedule too tight. It was too close to something else. I've had to make those choices before. Um, so I, I, I tend to choose the one that's got their shit together. Because I know that I'm not going to be left in the lurch. I know that they've got their, their heads on straight. And then when I get there, I'm going to have a schedule and I'm going to have a room assigned to me. And there's probably people that have signed up for my games and uh, we're all going to have a good time. Uh, what what I look for is people running around uh, angry that something was screwed up. And I don't see that at these four. I have at others. Um, they have good staffs. They have good organization. They're all gamers at heart. All the organizers that run all the all those four the, all four of those cons are run by gamers. They know what makes a good gaming experience. They know how to organize. There's some crossbreeding there. The, the, some, the, some of the people from Boston are also help uh, from Massachusetts. It's not really Boston. Are also heavily involved in some of the organiz organization at Gen Con. Organization and communications to me, and not just with me as, as a guest or as a DM even, but lots of communications with the potential attendees is very, very important to run a good con. Um, when I first moved to Cincinnati, a, a few of my buddies that I still game with and I kind of gravitated into taking over a con that was floundering and we did real well. And then the young Turks were, <laughs> okay, hey, you know, because a couple of my buddies decided to get married and have kids. And so we all just kind of backed away from it and it all just went into the crapper for years. Um, so, um, I know what makes a bad con. I've been involved in a couple. I tried to 
reorganized one and, and failed. Um, so I look for organization. I look for who's, I also, you as, 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 as an, a potential attendee should look at who they've asked there to be their guests. Do you know who they are? Are you familiar with the, the games that they do? Or are you interested in finding out more? I mean, you don't have to be a player to want to go. But look at the cons that attract quality guests, well-known authors, well-known game designers, well-known game writers. They're probably the best organized because we get too many invitations to waste our time on you know bad weekends. As, as, as much as anything, that's a good rule of thumb, I think. Um, good news for the poor backers of the Kickstarter for the Memorial Tomb. Um, tr the Troll Lords, God bless them, have st stepped in and said they're going to help bail, bail Ernie out. As you all know, Ernie Gygax uh, got really, really sick, cancer, operations, etc. And... Um, his erstwhile partner absolutely dropped the ball worse than a trying to catch a greased pig. Um, not that surprising that he should do that. It's, it is uh, way above and beyond for the trolls. And then it just shows that the trolls devotion to the guy, uh, the original guy family still remains strong. Um, all right. Now, <clears throat> Got two more things we're going to talk about. This is a long one tonight. Um, this week on Facebook, there was a couple of neat uh, postings that I saw that I, I freaked out and loved. Uh, it was about coked up uh, wild hogs. And I speculated on how many hit points you'd have to hit uh, a, a coked up wild hog before he knew he was dead, etc. And that started a lot of fun. And uh, we had we had a lot of fun with that. Oddly enough, it didn't turn into a, a, a stupid, stupid fest. So it prompted me to tell why I have a, fa a fondness for giant hogs. In my very first campaign down at Carbondale, before we rebooted, back when we were playing little three three little books, everything did a D6, etc. Um, I had some giant hogs in a room. And this, again, this is back when too much stuff in too many rooms, et cetera, et cetera. But anyway, so my group, they're all second, third level guys. And they're, you know, they hear snuffling behind the door and uh, it smells like a pig's die. And so um, <laughs> the, the the meat sack at the front decided, okay, I'm, I'm going to charge in. And uh, our idiot magic user, Neil, um, decided that it would be a good idea to chunk in a fireball over over our guy's head into the back of the room just to you know to help him out like a really big bad idea flashbang uh it was just a small room it certainly killed the two giant hogs and it also killed the the pc who thereafter was known as hog bait and right now I'd have to go back and look at the list to see what his name really was because I can't remember anything but Hogbait. I do know that Hogbait went on to become an attorney and went to work in the Illinois State um, um, legal system. Uh, he was a district court something or other, I believe, uh, which proved that you know, D and D didn't ruin him either. But uh, I have I had a fondness because that was one of the most that was one of the earliest horrific deaths in uh, my my campaigns. So there's a fondness for uh, giant hogs. And the idea of a 400-pound feral hog uh, digging up and eating 80 pounds of cocaine, like one of the stories. Oh, um, yeah, I can just imagine uh, putting up, I'm going to put, I mean, figure out, just plan, you're going to see coked egg pigs <laughs> in my next adventure. Um, and then I was asked about and okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna just give some encounters about uh, D and D in the service, who played and who didn't, and gaming in the service. Um, of course, when I was I was in the service before there was role playing, so uh, but I did game uh, board games 
um, with one guy uh, in one squadron. We played uh, 1914 a bunch. We would play for the whole weekend uh, and set up on Friday. Well, all day Friday, we were around, did the deployment. And then right after chow, we went and deployed in the laundry room, deployed our units. And then we played until uh, more muster on Monday morning. And um, I played that a lot. And then when I went overseas, we played uh, we played a lot of cards, but we also played um, some 3M board game or some 3M bookshelf games. And the one we played the hell out of was um, stocks and we played some stocks and bonds, and then realized the rather predictable curve. But we played a game called Acquire, and it's it's a real simple, subtly simple um, tile game where you acquire. You you build hotel chains and then you absorb smaller ones, and not lose your controlling interest. And um, we we played that, we played the hell out of it. Um, we went through three or four sets. I know I bought the very last. I, I bought at least two and possibly three at the Civic Bay PX, all their stock because we kept wearing them out because we literally wore the the ink off the raised portion of the tile so we could see the the printing on the tile um we played that a ton but um beyond that i don't have a lot of experience but i do have experience on the other end some of the strange phone calls i got when i was working at tsr uh one day when i was working at tsr i got a phone call and um it was a guy in the army and he was all excited about having figured out and gotten through to me. And he had a rules question. And so he starts explaining the rules question. He says, wait a minute. And I hear this, whir, click, screech, whir, whir, whir. and then he comes back on. So this goes on and we, we talk for a couple of minutes. And then, wait a minute. Okay. And this is like. Well, we were in the gray building, so it's sometime 70, 70, 76 or later. Um, I asked him, what the hell was going on with his phone connection? He said, oh, I'm changing satellites. And I said, excuse me, you're changing satellites? Oh, yeah, well, I'm, I didn't tell you. I'm calling from the bunker underneath Camp David. Well, at the time, the general public didn't even know. There was a super secret bunker beneath Camp David. And this guy, yeah, hey, and he he he's calling TSR to uh get some rules clarifications from this super secret bunker underneath Camp David. Oh yeah, well, no compromise to national security there, I'll bet. Now if that isn't bad enough. There's a Air Force SAC underground thing. I believe it's under White Mountain in the Rockies. I think Colorado, maybe. I, don't pin me down on that, but I know it was White Mountain. And there's a big underground, super secure blast doors, Air Force missile firing thing. I got a call from there. Now, they had better equipment. <laughs> Because they only had to do the wah, 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 like about every eight minutes. But I got a call from underneath there. Now, at the time, I'd be willing to wager that the only thing more secure in the United States infrastructure at the time was the war room underneath the White House. So you got to wonder what are these guys that are underground doing? Playing war games. Gotta wonder. Now, if that wasn't scary enough, a fact I learned about our U.S. Navy, my beloved Navy, and their boomer fleet. Now, the boomers were the big subs from the on the East Coast that uh, were all they they deploy for 30, 45 days at a time, never coming up for air. Nobody ever knew where our boomers were because we were our boomers were out stalking Russia's boomers, and we were playing um, uh, Red October games under the ocean. 
Now, on these subs, they have two crews, the, the blue crew and the gold crew. The subs go out for 30, 40, 45 days, come back in, get a quick refurbish, dry, you know, not dry dock, but, you know, refuel, top up everything, fix a little shit, and then they swap crews. So the gold crew comes off, the blue crew goes on, the ship goes back out to sea. Most of, I've been led to believe, of the boomers had a set of D&D books that belonged to the boat. There's a, there's a practice in the Navy, especially during wartime or emergency circumstances, called hot bunking. That's when there's not enough berths on board the boat for everybody to have their own rack, bed, hammock, <laughs> sling, whatever you picture. And the term comes from, he just got out, you just got in. It's usually when you're on 12 and 12s, you know, 12 on, 12 off, that type of thing. So these guys were hot bunking their game. They were hot, hot d and ding on the submarines. Now, it was common knowledge that lots of submarines played D&D. Lots of them. I would say the vast majority of the boats had at least one of the two crews that played. Because it seems to me that from the anecdotal evidence I got, at least 80% played. Because I've had submariner after submariner or submariner, however you put uh, tell me the same stories about when they were back then, 70s, 80s, height of the Cold War. What were they doing un under underneath the water for days on end? They were killing shit and taking their stuff. <laughs> Gotta love it. Our armed forces prepared for any eventuality, including orcs. And if they can swim underneath... They're uh, in big trouble. They're going to be orc frogmen planting, planting poop bombs on the submarines. Must be getting late. At that, I'll say, uh, send in your questions. We're setting up a website to uh, send in when you subscribe automatically so we can better service and let you know how to get your dice. I know that's been a problem. I apologize. Uh, we have too many irons in the fire right now, as you've probably figured out by now. Um, I still try to come and do one of these every week that I'm not traveling, but uh, we have a lot of irons in the fire. We have a website coming up. I'm going to be sharing some of the art uh, for the Kickstarter that's going to start on January 15th. Um, that's all I got for now. Send me your questions and comments, and then I'll have a script for next time. Do Dada Govi. Welcome to my cellar. He's the curmudgeon who wrote about the dungeons. Now he's the feller, live from the cellar. Talks about D and D and old school RPGs. Still quite a feller, the curmudgeon in the cellar. Last man around when the race went down. Calling Gary in that Lake Geneva town. Hey Gary, it's an awful mess. Let me edit, we'll have success. D&D &D and Dragon Magazine. He's a curmudgeon who wrote about the dungeons. Now he's the feller, live from the cellar. Talks about D&D &D and old school RPGs, but still quite the feller. A curmudgeon in the cellar. Magic missile, it's a mortar shell. Make it hit in the first level spell. From Psyonix to the game to attack that wizard brain. DSR and fantasy. Collection of micro armory. Tight with tramp under a tree. High as could be. He's the curmudgeon who wrote about the dungeons. Now he's the feller. Live from the cellar. Talks about D&D and old school RPGs, but he's still quite the feller, the curmudgeon in the cellar. 
still quite a feller, the curmudgeon in the cellar. Curmudgeon.